Welcome to episode number 67 of the Animals at Home podcast. If you are new here, welcome to the show. My name is Dylan Perrin. If you are a regular listener, then thank you very much for tuning in. As always, this is the podcast that inspires others to push the limits of their reptile husbandry by promoting the importance of high-level creative care individualized for each reptile. So if you do follow along with the Animals at Home Network schedule, you know that this is actually Animals Everywhere's Weekend. That's Bryce Broom's podcast, and I have stolen that. I'm going to post an episode this week, and then he's going to do one next week. We sometimes will kind of mess around with the schedule just based off of our own personal lives, what we have going on, and we sort of help each other out that way. I have been incredibly busy. I've kind of gone back to work, which has been super busy. Then also, I've been working on a massive Brazilian rainbow boa project. It's not a massive project. It just had a bunch of different parts to it and pieces to it and little projects inside the project that took me a very long time, and I basically destroyed my entire apartment in the process it was a giant mess for weeks i have pretty much finished that completely and now i'm editing it so it's a kind of a i'm, I'm hoping it's gonna be a really exciting video and just something fun and there's some just cool ideas so it, i took my four by two by two pvc enclosure for my brazilian rainbow bow and just added some new things like ventilation and proper lighting lighting and a, a really kind of neat water feature i'm only i'd say 80 percent happy with it i think the enclosure is still too small i'd like something that's a little bit bigger but it's cool I'll, I'll show you some of the projects that i did so if you are interested in watching that make sure you're subscribed on youtube and it should be out next week depending on how much editing i get in as always if you're looking for more information on this episode head to animals at home network.com and then you can head to the animals at home podcast header at the top and you'll find all the show notes for all the different episodes there if you're interested in supporting the show definitely share the content and give it a rating on the apple podcasting app we have a bunch of five star ratings i think it's probably over 60 by now which is way higher than the average podcast typically podcasts only have i think it's average of like five or six ratings and we have way more than that so if you have someone that's rated thank you so much if you haven't rated the podcast yet that's one great way you can help support the show and the last thing you can do is head to animals at home network.ca slash shop and pick yourself up a t-shirt or a sweater and that's where five dollars does get donated to the amazon rainforest conservancy we're actually close to hitting i think over five hundred dollars of donations for that charity so that's been something that i'm super proud of and i can't wait to see that number grow thank you very much to custom reptile habitats.com who is the sponsor of the podcast if you want anything reptile related high quality equipment universal rock backgrounds maximum reptile enclosures go to the link in my description in the youtube description or the show notes it is an affiliate link so if you do pick up something a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you which of course helps support me and the show all right let's jump into today's podcast i'll tell you guys a quick story about how this episode started i actually recorded this episode on the exact same day i recorded last week's episode with ash norman so i woke up that morning and did my usual kind of get ready for the podcast, review a few notes before I started talking to Ash. And part of it, I was just kind of flipping through Instagram, kill, killing some time. And I saw Mike Titula post an Instagram story that had a picture of a road map from Calgary, Alberta to Winnipeg, Manitoba. And I thought, huh, is Mike driving through Manitoba? That's obviously the province that I live in, live in Winnipeg. And so I thought I should send him a message. And then I realized he's actually moving. So when he responded to my message, he said, yes, I'm moving to Ontario, driving through Winnipeg. So I thought, oh, too bad. If, if I had known you were coming or if you were going to be here longer, I would have loved to record a podcast with you, but we'll do that at some point in the future. And then he thought, well, or then he responded and just said, well, I'm staying the night, so I'd still love to record a podcast. So I said, okay, let's do it. So he drove for 14 hours all day. I think he got into Winnipeg around 8 or 8.30. I met him at a random hotel about 20 minutes from my home, so it was really close. And you know, I think we started recording at around just after 9 o'clock at night and super impromptu. If you guys listen to my show, you know that typically, or at least I hope you perceive that I am well prepared for each episode. I like to go through some notes, make some notes, have some talking points, and have a general understanding of my guest or the direction I want the conversation to go and in this case of course I did not have time to do that I had a busy day anyway he was driving all day so we just kind of winged it and that's why if you're watching this on YouTube there is no video we didn't film it or anything we just had the conversation I brought my podcasting equipment and uh, we had a chat in the conversation we cover a bunch of different things he talks about his move how stressful that is and how to you know how he's moved 20 plus animals across the country. He talks about his YouTube channel. We talk about Brian Barcheck, which I know is also a contentious subject. And, you know, of course, I've always maintained my position that I think Brian moving into the direction of the zoo is something that's positive. And I'm really not a fan of the ad hominem attacks that people use on the internet, not just for Brian, but for anybody. And I've talked about that before. So we discuss that. And then we also discuss 
the best plants you can use in a vivarium. If you watch Mike's channel, you know that every single enclosure he has is really well planted. So I kind of wanted to pick his brain about which plants to use and how to have some success in that domain. And then we just wrap up the conversation with a few future plans that Mike has with his channel. And he reveals a project that he's working on that he has yet to announce. So if you make it to the end of this podcast, you'll find a hopefully something that Mike does spark up in the next few months or so. And other than that, I think we're just going to jump into the conversation. So I hope you enjoy the chat and I will talk to you when we are all wrapped up. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you for doing this. No problem. Happy to be here. As we were just saying, this is like the most impromptu podcast I've ever done. Uh, I recorded one earlier today. You have driven from Calgary to Winnipeg. Yes, the the classic 14-hour drive. So how tired are you? On a scale of 1 to 10, 12 and a half. <laughs> yeah, I figured. I was like, I saw you post the story on Instagram this morning. I'm like, you know what? I should just ask just to see because it said Winnipeg. I don't even know if you were staying here or you are just driving through. And you're yeah. Like, you were like, yeah, I'm good to do it. So let's do it. <laughs> hey, I, I remember it was, it was probably a couple of years ago that you reached out before and I didn't have time or whatever. It didn't work out. And I was like, you know what? I'm here for a day. Let's just get it done. And maybe some point in the future, if this goes well, I'll be back on with a more full setup and ready to go. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the second episode I've ever done in person. So that's one cool thing. Sweet. Um, so that, that's cool. But I think it's also a testament to either the reptile community or reptile community and Canadians that we are two people that have never met. True. We just randomly show up in a hotel <laughs> yep. in the middle of Winnipeg and I bring all this equipment and you have all your moving stuff and we're just like, whatever, it should be fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just impromptu. Let's, let's get it going, get this done and uh, make some new friends. My wife's like, should you have like a safe word or something? Or like, <laughs> should you like have a text that automatically goes out if you don't come back? I'm like, I think it'll be fine. But uh, anyway, let's chat about some reptiles. Let's do it. So tell me how you got started in in this hobby. How I got started is pretty much like most people our age, I'll guess, around the same age. Uh, basically, Steve Irwin kind of brought it on when I was like five, six years old. At the age of eight, I got my first reptile. It was a leopard gecko. So... <clears throat> So we got that going, and just ever since then, um, it, it's really stuck with me. Like we had, my mom and I went to classes at the zoo before we got my first lizard. We looked up methods to contain crickets from escaping because my parents were paranoid about that. It was a whole thing, but yeah, it was basically the influence of Steve Irwin, and then just kind of the the same for me. I was like, man, I want to be that guy. Like he's done so cool, or he's done so well. He's done so many cool things it's just something that i would love to emulate or be the canadian version of so well and you started on youtube very young so was that part of that was that i mean your first video is somebody getting flown off a bridge (laughs) (laughs) which i went and found today i was like how and it it was 10 years ago yeah yeah 10 years ago in august 23rd i think i uploaded my first video so a decade on YouTube. And YouTube back then was literally just people like getting hurt. <laughs> like, Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> so you were kind of fitting that niche. But then, so was Steve Irwin part of the influence to go onto YouTube? Um, honestly, I don't specifically remember that, that decision part of it. The more likelihood was just me essentially thinking that, you know what? I want to learn stuff from people there's not really many people on the internet that are doing this and who knows, maybe I can teach people, learn some stuff and then show it to people rather than just kind of have it buried in the depths of weird conventions at the zoo and things like that. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And so once you, you, you got your first leopard gecko, which you still have. Yep. And then how soon after that was it, the expansion happened? It happened relatively slow because my parents were quite uh, strict and, and I guess, resilient to the whole reptile thing. Uh, they definitely love Stryker and they, they love to have him around. So it, that was kind of nice. But it, it took a couple years. I got Stryker and then three or four years later, I got my first, well, I guess my second leopard gecko. And then after that, it kind of snowballed from there. It was... Um, I had weird stuff. Like I had uh, dwarf or pygmy chameleons. I had Lycodactylus Williams eye, which at the time I was 14 or 15. And, and those are such awesome little geckos too. Oh, they're incredible. And, and now they're Cites 1, so you 
can't get them anywhere. I didn't actually, I didn't realize that, but yeah. I know they're, I mean, Canada, everything is harder to get in Canada. Like, and, you know, you see people in the States and like, I just went to the expo and bought like everything you yeah. ever wanted. Here is always harder, but I didn't realize that there were CITES ones. That's probably one of the reasons they're harder to find. Yeah. And at the time I was, I was like, you know, I'm going to try and breed these and everybody out West was like, no, don't do it. I had 11 babies hatch and two of them lived. I had 10 babies hatched and one live. I have all this. And I was like, man, like you know what? This can't be that hard. I'm just going to go for it. So I ended up going for it. And I think at the time I had 13 or 14 babies hatch and 13 of the 14 lived. Wow. So at the time, I'm some kid that had no idea what he was doing but still was able to produce these quite reliably so was there a reason people were failing with them originally uh, not that i ever found out like i you just want like just winged it and it i worked. just went with it yeah like <laughs> i i knew their general temperatures i knew their general setup i knew all that kind of stuff i provided uvb yeah even at such a young age um it was just kind of a you know what can't be that hard let's go for it and I was clearly doing something right. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that that success rate speaks for itself, and that was actually one of the interesting things. So today, I was going through your videos, and especially I always go back to the old ones because it's always interesting. And you have Striker, and but even then, it's not the the setup was pretty decent. Like one of the things we always do, like when you first start in the hobby, you look back and you're like, oh my god, the the setup is terrible. But yours yeah. was actually not bad. But one of the things you said in it, and I guess this would have been however many years ago. Oh no! <laughs> but you, you, no, it was good. You actually said oh. one of the things that I wanted do and what you should always do is you should always be wanting to improve your leopard gecko's care Agreed. so that was interesting because i'm not sure how old you would maybe you're like 15 or 16 uh, yeah i was 10. 14 like yeah oh well, i'm 24 now so yeah 14 so, 10, so there you go yeah and that that's like the foundation of my podcast in general is just like trying to teach people that all you need to do is like want to progress it doesn't you don't have to start with the huge massive setup with the bioactive was spend a thousand dollars but if you can have that steady progression so is that something that you've always had i guess in you I, I guess, yeah, not, I mean, you pointing that out kind of, like, made it, uh, gave light to me that that actually <laughs> happened. But You're like, I'm smarter than I thought I, I was. Yeah, I was like, well, <laughs> who knows? But, I mean, I've always had a passion for biology, and, 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 like, I got my degree in bio last year, and it's always something that I've strived for, and so I guess me kind of wanting to recreate more natural habitats is, likely stems from that, um... I mean, even uh, there's a whole evolution of my leopard gecko tanks. Like it started off and everybody hates them. And occasionally I do too, but like the, the Zillow walnut shells, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's something that, uh, is a product that's in my opinion, kind of a uh, controversial, I suppose, but I used it for 13, 12, 13 years with my leopard gecko and, no issues with impaction or real shedding issues or anything like that. And I think it's just a, a testament to, you know, like if you keep them properly, they're tough. They're tough. Exactly. They're going to keep going. Yeah. yeah. So then it kind of evolved to a more naturalistic setup with a biopod. And then from, I didn't actually end up getting to use that. That's another story, but. <laughs> wait, wait, let's break, let's go into that for a okay, second. Because sure. the, the Biopod was that Kickstarter, right? Yeah. Can you, for those who don't know what that is, was that something, that wasn't Canadian, right? It was, yeah, no, oh, it was oh, Calgary. Was, I oh, worked for the company. Oh, you were there. Oh, maybe I shouldn't say that. But. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So that was a Calgary company. So for yeah. those of you that don't know what that was, can you quickly describe what the Kickstarter was? Essentially, it was one of Canada's most popular Kickstarters ever ever um it raised around 1.1 1. 1 million dollars somewhere wow. around there it was insanely successful and it was a calgary company a guy basically had this idea where he's going to make an all-in-one microhabitat. so it misted it heated it um air flowed like there was a fan in it so it pumped air into the actual tank itself and uh, overall it was a fairly good product. I mean, it had its flaws and, and some of the parts should have been made more quality rather than trying to find the cheapest parts possible. But in general, it was great. And quickly, there were some holes that were kind of found with it and some flaws in manufacturing and whatnot. And it ended up kind of perishing. But uh, 
I mean, people used it for what it's used for, and it was really good at growing plants. I bet it was. Yeah, it's a really interesting system. And I had like, I think it had even a little app that came with yep. it, and you could control the yep. climate and everything. So, did the people that participated in, or that were backers in the Kickstarter, did they actually get? A, did most they people did. get a product? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for the most part, I think there was a couple that there's some logistic shipping. Um, but I, I don't know. So. so the issue with it was just repairs and, and, you know, maintenance and whatnot. It was, I would like to say it's kind of an overcomplication of something that isn't necessarily needed mm. where there was just so many parts to it. There was so many issues with things breaking and it's okay, well, we'll send them a new part. And that just got too much. And, and it was a great product just or a great idea, just the manifestation of the product wasn't perfect, I suppose. Yeah, because it, it is a really, really cool idea, but it's almost like that idea is great for advanced keepers. Yeah. It's not good for new keepers. It's no. like just way too much information. Oh, and not only was it too much information, not everybody's got a grand lying in their bank to spend on one. <laughs> exactly, like, yeah. Even the smallest one, it was basically the size of a 10 gallon like it was 20 by 11 by 11 i'm pretty sure somewhere around there and it was five or six hundred dollars yeah so just so, way more than somebody wants to spend exactly and, yeah. and that's a small enclosure like what are you gonna put in there something like a couple yeah. of knolls or something exactly yeah interesting yeah so that uh, so i forget why we were talking about you were gonna you didn't end up using it so you actually got one but then you never used it or you just used it for plants i actually ended up setting it up and it did pretty well on the channel but i never ended up using it mm. um the heating actually failed so i was like well <laughs> guess i can't use this for <laughs> for my leopard gecko what, so what was it was it just a coil like how was it how did it, it heat? was a heat cable oh it was a heat yeah. cable. okay interesting yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that I remember seeing that when it came out. It was it was really cool. So anyway, let's bump back to sure. um your uh your the road trip you're on right now. Yep. Right now you're moving. Yeah. So everybody who there's I mean you have seventy thousand subscribers on YouTube, so people are very familiar with you have a pretty big reptile room. Yeah. So you did a tour a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And how many animals were in there at that time? Was it like forty or something? Um there's actually a lot less than a lot of people think there was there is, and even than I thought there was. Uh, I believe there's about 20, somewhere around there. It's still a fair number. It is, yeah. But um, I guess for you, you've had more at some points. For sure, yeah. yeah. Like I went through, and I still hope to get more back into it, but a, a dart frog phase. And um, that was a lot of individuals, right? Like there's still, I don't know, pretty much the same amount of tanks in the room, but there was just more like two, three dart frogs yeah, per yeah, tank, yeah. right? So. So how are most of your animals are coming with you to to Ontario? All of them, yeah. So how yeah. is that? How does that work? What are you doing to? Um, essentially, I luckily enough, my girlfriend lives in in Ontario, and I basically just ship them all out to her. She set up some bins and some temporary setups oh, for okay. them, and then when I get there. Um, I don't actually know when all my cages and things are going to get there because they're with the rest of your stuff. They're Correct. Your stuff. Yeah. Wow. So it's basically. A week or two in a bin for for most of the animals oh yeah that's then, not a big deal no and then there'll be there'll be a lot more enclosure builds on the channel coming soon <laughs> which is great for content but not great for the pocketbook correct yes <laughs> yeah. yeah it hurts a little bit but. that's a, the thing is like you you make a video and you make a project and you you end up spending so much more than you think you're going to spend. Like every time I do like an enclosure build, I'm like, oh, this would be like $300. And then I spend like 600. I'm like, how did that happen? Yeah. Like where, where did all that go? But you go to Home Depot and you buy screws and you buy this and that and it adds up so quickly. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, and even just time, like, I don't know, oh. I don't know how, uh, I, I, I guess the, the whole building on YouTube and things, people think it's like, oh yeah, just throw it together and set up a tripod. And if you want to make a decent video, it's taking you at least double the time. It, yeah, that's what at I always least. say. I say twice as long. If you're yeah. gonna film it, it takes twice as long. Absolutely. And yeah. you just and it's, it's like sometimes when I'm doing a build, I'll just do it where I'm just filming it, and then I'll just do voiceovers after. Yeah, because it's just so much easier, and oh, it's, so much it's not easier. necessarily <laughs> as entertaining. But you know, like Serpa Design, that's all he does almost. Yeah, because it's just way easier. Yeah, not yeah. saying it's a bad thing, but no, it's good. No, it's. I mean, hey, it works. <laughs> exactly. Um. So the. When you were growing up, you have this obsession with animals and reptiles. And then I knew you were mentioning that you went to school and you have a degree in biology. Was there a job that you were aiming for at some point along that time? or? Um, I mean, I'd love to work as a zoologist or, or a zookeeper even mm -hmm. just to get that experience under my belt. 
Um, I have, I've always loved venomous snakes, but we live in Canada and can't really keep them very easily. So I will not keep them, but I would much rather just look after them at a zoo or wherever. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's kind of the goal in mind, but I also love um, like DNA testing and genetics and things like that. So I did a, a research project in school on essentially sn- or spider genetics. Oh, cool. And we did all the DNR, DNA running and PCR and amplification and everything for these be- three species of spiders. And we actually determined that they should have been split into two separate species. Oh, really? So, yeah, it was. I feel like that always happens in, especially in the arachnid world. It's like yeah. so many, so many spiders that are separate species, but you call them the same. Oh yeah, yeah, and and these weren't anything special. Like these were just spiders that we caught outside. But yeah, it's still, I mean, when you're looking at two spiders and you're like, well, they're morphologically pretty similar, but genetically, genetically totally different. Totally different exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. Cool. So one of the things that is great about your channel is you have uh, you have lots of now. Na- I think most of your enclosures are naturalistic and, and planted yep. and whatnot. Did you ever go down a path of like industrialized style care? Honestly, no. Um, I have actually before I started tearing every tank down, I noticed that every single one of my tanks had live plants, and there was one without UVB. Wow. Yeah. So how did you avoid? not going down that industrialized style because it's, it's such a uh, it's like it has a gravitational pull in the hobby it does. for so many different reasons yeah. it's cheaper and it's easier and whatnot but did you just hate that or you just um i've just never found it super necessary for what i'm keeping or or what i desire i would much rather have an animal that can to some degree at least exhibit natural tendencies and mm-hmm. to kind of show off their uh, i guess instincts and uh that's just something that i've always striv- strived for so i love the like I-, I get it i know that the industrialized like the spotless you know cleaned with f10 every week or whatever <laughs> yeah. month people do yeah uh, i get that it has a place in the hobby for sure but it's just not really for me at this moment i mean if you're producing a bunch of snakes i get it like yes it, yeah <laughs> it's pretty much impossible to keep them all bioactive or whatever word you want to call it yeah so yeah that's kind of where it comes down to for me yeah no i i totally say i always say the same thing yeah there's the industrialized style care does have a place and you know keeping animals healthy and and for captive breeding and whatnot is good but it's i hate when i see you know someone has two snakes and keeps them both in a you know a a lightless rack or something just because they they that's what they see yeah but um it's like why why would you do that it's not it's not exciting you (laughs) can't see them um, as far as the the term bioactive, and uh, <laughs> you kind of chuckled when you did it, and when you said I it, I know the, exactly what you're about to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, because I learned that this was uh, a buzzword from Troy Goldberg. Yep. I don't know if you've listened to that episode I recorded I with him. Yeah, yeah, and he's a good buddy of mine. Yeah, so. he he was great. He was so awesome, and and that's where I learned that the dart frog people are just so far ahead of reptile people oh, yeah. in a lot of ways, and it's like they kind of laugh at the fact that we're now obsessed with bioactive. They're just like we've been doing this forever. Like bioactive yeah. is just regular care. And yeah. we're just like, Oh, it's bioactive, dude. It's so crazy. Yeah. So do you kind of have the same sort of feeling to the word? Um, I don't think it's quite as strong as Troy's feelings towards <laughs> the word. I recognize that it is, I mean, when it comes down to clicks and views and stuff, throw the term bioactive in there and you're bound to get more views. So yeah. it's kind of nice that way, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's, overused in a sense that a lot of people just don't understand what it is yes yeah. and they misuse it they throw a pothos or whatever in a tank and they're like oh it's bioactive now it's <laughs> yeah. like well there's a plant in there <laughs> yeah yeah so not really but it's yeah. nice that you have a plant but yeah, it's not. It's good effort but no yeah <laughs> so let's talk about plants because that's sure. what i think you have a lot of strength in the plant department thank you and there is that's a major weakness for most reptile keepers like even yeah. even me i love plants but i do struggle keeping them alive a lot of times mm-hmm. so maybe we'll start with do you have like favorite go-to plants that you like to use um there's typically i mean it depends what i'm setting up right or what i'm going to recommend for people to set up um pothos of course yeah. is one of those that's kind of that's a clutch proof yeah um if you do have animals that eat plants there are some uh, trichomes and things in there that can kind of mess with them however um bill strand a, a chameleon longtime chameleon keeper uh, has a great resource where it kind of gives everything that is 
verified as veiled chameleon edible. So there's a whole list of plants that it's like, yep, it's eaten this, 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 and there's no ill signs. There's no issues with the animal. So it's kind of safe because yeah, yeah. there's really no reptile safe plant list online. I mean, there's a no. couple websites that have one up there or they have a list of plants that are kind of like, well, yeah, like these are okay, but we don't really know. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I mean, to recommend a couple of course, pothos, bromeliads are awesome as well. Um, it really does depend on the animal. Cause I mean, yeah. things like dart frogs and things that like the more humid, I suppose, environments are bound to get more plant recommendations than things like leopard geckos and stuff like that. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, the arid, arid animals tend to get a little bit of the short end of the stick in terms of plants, but they also oh, kind of sure. destroy plants. So have you yeah. done some arid, arid yeah. plants? What do, what do you use mostly? Um, I used pretty much all the succulents I could find. Yeah. And I found that aloe does pretty well. Uh, Haworthia did pretty well. There was a couple like hen and chicks did pretty well. I mean, it really depends on the setup. Yeah, yeah. Um, my kind of philosophy with keeping leopard geckos and things is a little bit different than what most people might think. Yeah. Um, what, do, what do you mean? I like to spray them at least once a week. Yeah. Um, and or soak the substrate. Like, I think, uh, I know Dave Kaufman did a, a good episode on red Aki monitors in the Outback. And... Uh, he basically like shoved a humidity probe into one of the burrows. And he's like, Hey, out here, it's 23% humidity buries it down into the, into the den and it's 90% humidity. Yeah, yeah. So when we're keeping leopard geckos in these bone dry substrates and all this stuff, it's kind of like, well, you know, they got to have a similar effect. They're in a, I mean, obviously not the same environment, but a similar environment. Yeah. And down in their burrows, they're going to have urates. They're going to have uh, defecations and things like that. And just natural humidity from whatever rain is locked yeah. in the ground. So I think that having a slightly more humid tank or just spikes in humidity once a week or every few days isn't going to harm the animal. Yeah. Obviously if it's staying at 90% humidity, well, then you might have an issue, but it's so true. I think that's one thing that the reptile community fails at a lot is we just take these standard numbers temperature humidity and then that's everything it's like that's yeah. where you want the entire enclosure to be at but 100%. like micro niches and micro in climates and in these environments are a real thing and that's where these animals typically spend most of their time absolutely burrowing and whatnot so that's yeah. a i know people who miss their bearded dragons often as well for that yeah. same reason yeah let the humidity drop during the day but then bump it up at night yeah absolutely yeah, interesting. Um, so it's, it's getting back to the plants because... Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no, no worries. Diversion. We're, that's the point. We have a, the, the diversions are great. Um, were plants something that you were super interested before you got into reptiles or did the reptile, did that interest come in because of keeping? It was definitely because of keeping. Mm -hmm. um, and it was not even reptiles, it was dart frogs. Well, that's yeah. what really got me into the whole plant game or whatever you want to call it like uh, i mean in all the boxes behind us here i know you guys can't see but there's tanks oh, and gotta, tanks and bins oh my gosh those are all those are all full plants of over there. plants yeah <laughs> so yeah you have probably what is this like eight containers eight giant totes of all plants of plants yeah so yeah. um why what are they why are they in there are those plants that came out of enclosures or those plants that you were just growing in their own those are just plants that i was growing on their own um they have I mean, I didn't really trust shipping them, especially because I didn't know when I was going to get them. Right. And shipping this many plants overnight would have been wildly expensive. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, you know what? I'm driving. I'll just throw them in my back of the car and, and drive them across the country. Do you have room for anything else? <laughs> no, the, the car is totally full of just plants. <laughs> <laughs> that's and I think awesome. there's some fruit flies as well. That's about it. Yeah, yeah. So how are you having so much success with plants? Because like I said, reptile people kill plants all the time. And yeah. not only the reptiles kill them, but also the people kill them. Yeah. So are you were you doing something to have healthy plants? Um, I, no, not specifically i think it's just i have experience growing plants where most people kind of get a pot those from walmart or whatever and throw it in their tank and a lot of people don't realize that the the casual misting you'll give your crested gecko or whatever isn't enough water yes. to sustain those plants yeah or it goes to the other end where there's too much water and you get in the anaerobic bacteria in the substrate and it just submerges the plant roots in water and 
can't do much about yeah, that. Yeah, and they rot and they go. Yeah. Yeah, and another big one is lighting too. People don't have yeah. enough light and they just assume that, you know, the light from the window that's like you know, 40 <laughs> feet across the room is yeah. going to light the tank enough, but it's not. Well, I get that question more than some people might think. It's just, well, I have a, a window in the room. The room's really bright. Do I have enough light? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I can <laughs> yeah. promise you you don't have enough yeah, light. That is almost no light. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, that's like very, very low light. So, I mean, you can try and it might live but it's definitely not going to thrive exactly i remember when i was talking to john courtney smith he was saying with uh with just a t5 the amount of lux that produces is similar to like 5 30 in the morning like yeah. that's like the sun just coming up yeah so you can imagine how uh, with a window the diffuse window is absolutely nothing yeah. but then even with like a jungle dawn or leds and, and a t5 you're still nowhere near what the sun is giving these plants. Exactly. And and something to keep important, like with the, the whole sun analogy, is a lot of these plants are in moderately dense canopied forest. That's true. So they yeah. are growing in not full sun by any means, but obviously more than the, the typical T5 will provide. And I know a lot of people will use like the natural light from exoterra and things like that and they're still two percent uvb and a lot of times the uvb will burn the plants before they actually promote growth on the plants yeah those those coil things yeah yeah yeah, yeah. those those don't work very well no. so what are you using for lights for most most of your enclosures actually shout out to john they're pretty much all arcadia jungle oh, yeah. dawns yeah the, yeah. the jungle dawn is an amazing light oh, it is expensive sure. it is but it's totally worth it yeah and it's crazy to see like i sun blaster has a decent led it, it's crazy to see the difference between an arcadia and say a sun blaster like you'll have the same 12 inch bulb over top of two tanks and the arcadia one is just so much brighter yeah um and i haven't actually dropped the bank on a on a par meter yet but i know that time is coming yeah. and that's what i'm going to use to do a test of a lot of different plant lights and things like that just to see you know hey, this is X this par from this distance from the bulb with the screen there. Yeah, like, yeah. Keep that in mind so you can grow these list of plants hypothetically. Yeah. Yeah, it is amazing how bright that light is. So that would be actually a cool little thing to have because especially if you see them side by side, you can yeah. see it like clear as day that they're, Absolutely. they're, they're definitely different. Um, have you ever played around with trying to take plants that are native to the range of the animal that you're keeping? Um unintentionally yes mm. um i've never done like a true biotope tank i know have a, i have a few buddies that are trying to do that right now uh with madagascar so good luck <laughs> yeah. um but uh, like i have a lot of south american plants and that's where like ufago pumilio and stuff comes from i saw them in costa rica i saw a lot of what their plants were like and and how their habitat actually was which was very interesting to see but um yeah in general it's not an intentional choice, but more of just like a, oh, these are from Costa Rica and, and Central America. So yeah, there's I, I've tried to go down that path, but it, it's actually tougher than it than it Much seems. Tougher. Like you just want to, then you, then you're like you end up looking for seeds on the internet basically, yeah. and you're just like, well, I don't even know if I can grow plants from seeds, so what's the point? But and a lot of times, seed aren't actually what they say they are. Oh really? When you do yeah. online orders? Oh yeah, all the time. I get I ordered some. I think it was just the um, Hemianthus calicotroides cuba. And it's a very common aquarium plant, but grows really, really well uh, outside of the water. Mm. And uh, <laughs> I caught the plant. There's just random weeds growing out of it. <laughs> I was like, well, I guess that was a waste of five bucks, but here we are. <laughs> so they gave you seeds and you had to wait. Like they, they germinated, came yeah. up, and then it was just something totally different. T totally different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, it's tempting to want to do like a biotope thing. So I think it's easier in the aquarium world. For, maybe it's not. I don't know. Maybe I'm just making that up. But it's just with the with, with reptiles, like you, you know, most of the plants that make up their environments are trees. Yeah. So they're, you know, crosses off. <laughs> Good <like>. luck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you're stuck with like the shrubs. But yeah. Um, is, are there any other plants that you think that are like go-tos that people don't really know a lot about? Because um, pothos is like the classic Classic pothos. I mean, I love anthuriums and things. I know they can be a little bit harder to grow, but even just philodendrons, mm -hmm. um, philodendron micans is, is a good one. Um, 
I love varicosum, but now the whole houseplant hobby has kind of destroyed the the availability of that plant. Oh, so. that's there's an obsession over there with that one, or oh, it's it's insane. Just the prices of houseplants and things like oh, that, which yeah. end up being perfect terrarium plants, but they're two hundred dollars for like oh a rooted God. cutting and stuff like that. And you're like, what? How are you okay? Well, and people are like, yeah, this thing. is a great decoration. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're like, I'm just gonna grow it in my house and see what happens. And, and then like, it okay. dies. Yeah. Sure thing. That was the thing. When COVID happened, I feel like the greenhouses just got stripped because everyone was like, I have nothing to do. I'm just going to grow plants in my house. And I guarantee half those plants are dead. Oh, for sure. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Return customers. They're like, well, I killed the first one, so I'm back again. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Still stuck inside. They only last six weeks. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Where in Costa Rica did you go? Um, We went to Securis. Um, Where's that? It's essentially... uh, This is really testing, but uh, it was (laughs) on the... Gulf of Mexico side. Okay. And it was, it, it's like pre Montaigne is basically what it is. It's actually the Costa Rican amphibian research center. Oh, cool. Um, it's run by a, a researcher named Brian Kubicki. Uh, he was awesome. He, is that what you went there for to, to do some r- work with them or no, no, well not, no. Me or like my, volunteering, I should say. Not even, no, we actually planned a trip out there. Me and, oh, cool. me and one of my buddies just kind of, well, we had a lot of people on the trip, but all of them ended up bailing last minute. So we ended up going just us two. It was the first time we met. We land in Costa Rica and it's like, Hey man, what's up? Like you hadn't met him let, before. No, never. So how did you, how did that, is it another Instagram, reptile person? Yeah. Just a, just a buddy through Instagram and, and we were kind of talking and we we're aware of each other, but we had never actually met in, in person. So <laughs> wow. it was kind of like a landing in Costa Rica and some foreign country for the first time. And it's, meeting a new friend. So you met him in San Jose, like in Costa Rica. Yes, correct. <laughs> yeah. And then we took like a private bus tour up to Securities and Brian Kubicki met us there. And it was essentially, I think it's around a hundred acres. I don't, I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head, but yeah, it was around a hundred of acres, hundred acres of just like new growth and old growth forests, primary and secondary and a lot of animals. I've been to Costa Rica twice and uh, it is just an amazing country. I love it. I, if there was another place I'd move, it'd probably be down there just for the the lush rainforest and awesome people. And, the people are great. Yeah. yeah. And they're super, they love tourists there. So yeah. it's not like they see you and you're like, Oh, here's another tourist like, yeah. ruining our country. They like the tourists for and, sure. And they're nice to them there. And, and that's what I always say. If you know, people who've never been to a rainforest before, it's impossible to really understand it. You know, like part of what I do with the podcast is I try to promote, you know, conservation and I do make donations to a, to a charity that supports, you know, per, the Peruvian Amazon rainforest awesome. or conserves it. Like save the Choco or? Um, they, they are, it's uh, Amazon rainforest conservancy. They have a, okay. a patch of land in Peru. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah, no, they're awesome. And you know, it's so hard to justify donating to a rainforest if you've never been to one. And that's what I was 100%. trying to tell like the, the director, the, the founder of this charity, like, you guys need to come up with a way to like make that because all you need to do is walk into rainforest once for it to never leave you again. Like the feeling. Absolutely. It's yeah. just an amazing experience. And one of, I had the the ability to go down to Belize actually for a, a, an actual research program. And, um, we got to see firsthand the flash and burn and that mm. might've, that was probably one of the hardest, I guess like, bold realizations to see just to kind of hit in the chest that you take when you pull down a road and the tour guides say, Hey, listen, from here where we are to that mountain way down there was all pristine rainforest. And just 20 feet uh, earlier, like we saw it, there, there was all slashed down, all cut down. And it's just, is one of those things where it's like, I wonder how many species undiscovered species just went extinct because they're local to this specific area exactly and it's just heartbreaking to see and i get the the need to live and the need to support our growing human population population but ooh, it was it was a harsh realization for sure yeah it's definitely something that's worth highlighting and if, for sure if you and that's why i wish everybody could have the experience of being in a rainforest because yeah. you just it's you could be in there for hours in one spot and not get bored yeah you could stand there and spin in a circle for three hours and (laughs) see a new plant or a a, a cool little millipede running along the ground or a a bird or like a blue morpho or yeah toucan anything it's just 
or Insane. monkeys like the monkeys yeah. are, they're so crazy there it's just yeah we amazing. didn't we didn't see any monkeys that trip but oh, did oh, you, you happen see to mon- see any in Costa Rica oh yeah when we went I saw tons of monkeys nice. we saw lots of howlers and uh, nice. is it capuchin monkeys there yep. and spider monkeys capuchin. too I think there's only three species of monkey in Costa Rica yeah and so we got to see them all and cool yeah it's um it's just ridiculous yeah. especially being in Canada where we just have squirrels <laughs> at least you have black squirrels, squirrels and in, <laughs> you guys have the black squirrels in Calgary true see that's Very exciting true. for Winnipeg we just got the gray ones oh, but man. <laughs> yeah no it's it's it is it is amazing did you see any uh interesting reptiles there oh we did actually it was a real shame because the first night uh brian basically said you know what like i'm gonna go check up on some construction on the trails do you guys want to come with like no charge just come on with us we'll we're it's gonna be a trek like we're going out there we're going hiking we're getting to the place and walking back it's not gonna be a a free tour for you guys we're like okay cool like well come along why not and uh we're walking up the trail and he's like you know when you guys are here just he's walking backwards up a, a slight incline and he's like you know when you're here just keep your eyes <laughs> on the trail and and don't look around like keep focus especially at nighttime because there are plenty of fertilants there can be bushmasters there can be all these various different venomous reptiles and sure enough he turns around about two feet from him is a fertilance just sitting on the oh trail he's like okay um don't do what i just did and we just kind of <laughs> chased it off the trail um that's amazing to see though oh it was beautiful but we didn't bring our cameras because it was oh. just like a quick you know let's get going and that was the only fertilance we saw the whole trip. We tried every day. Yeah. You'll never and find a snake when you're looking for it. No, definitely not. So <laughs> it's um, always an accident. We saw a long list of stuff though. We saw, um, like lemur leaf frogs. We saw Cruzio Hyla Sylviae. We saw, um, gliding tree frogs. I don't remember their scientific name, but there's a, there's a bit on BBC actually of the breeding behavior and, and, whole process of of laying eggs and fertilization and stuff on bbc and uh they they actually filmed it at the same place we were at like at the exact same pond wow so that was pretty cool to kind of take a part in is that on youtube it is yeah i'll have to look for it i'll put it in the show notes because people love to see that yeah it's cool yeah it was really cool yeah i think what else i there's lots of like i'm sure you saw iguanas there's a no was there i forget i think is there there's iguanas there. I think mm-hmm. I've seen, yeah, the iguanas. Yep. And, and then there's lots of basilisk and things like that. And Yeah, we we saw one basilisk, basilisk on our, on our I guess, trip up to there, but they weren't all that high up. Yeah. Um, we saw a ton of Ufaga pumilio. Oh, yeah. We saw a few of the erratus, the Costa Rican erratus. Oh, cool. Um, what else did we see? Did you see, see any boas? No, we didn't. I saw I one boa, but it was one. dead. Oh. It was on the road, yeah, oh, yeah. It was the roadkill. It was so it was so sad because that, that's something I would love to see. Wild boa. Yeah, absolutely. We we're we we're also trying to look for um, eyelash vipers, but it was kind of out of the range. Uh, There's we saw cat eyed snakes. We found a couple coral snakes, which was cool. Oh, cool. That's cool. Um, we got a like an armor back millipede. I don't think that's their actual name for them, but I'm blanking. Um, it's like a flat back millipede that. It looks like something from the Cretaceous, just ancient, cool, <laughs> crazy little millipede. Um, yeah, the bugs in the rainforest are crazy. <laughs> oh, they're wild. They're so big. There's yeah. some huge bugs there. Oh, bullet ants, plenty of those. Oh, yeah. Those were... Yeah, leafcutter ants, bullet ants. Yeah. Leafcutter ants are everywhere. Yeah. They're just always marching around. <laughs> it's so cool. And, you know, we that was actually our project in, in Belize, was researching uh, leafcutter ant um, trails and, and activity and stuff. And it's wild. Like just the, the different clades and kind of classes they have in their own community where there's the soldiers and there's little tiny, I can't remember what they were called, but little tiny ants that sit on the back of the leaves when they're carrying them and keep pests off them. Wow. Yeah. It's (laughs) wild. Like you, you wouldn't know unless you sat there and really looked at these ants just kind of traipsing through the forest. But yeah, I don't, the, the world's crazy. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. And leaf cutter ants are one of those things where it's like uh, you land and, and you start walking through the rainforest and they're one of the first things you'll notice. Yep. And as somebody who, you see leaf cutter ants on like, you know, on Discovery Channel and whatnot. So when you see them yeah. in person, it's like the first amazing thing. And the locals are like, yeah, we don't give a shit about these. These, yeah. are, these are here all the they're time. Here. Yeah. But that's like, oh my God, look how cool it is. Like they're yeah. everywhere and they're all carrying a little leaf. And <laughs> Well, especially coming from a place like Canada. Like if you're coming from 
another place in Central America or like Malaysia or something like that. It might not be as novel to you or as unique to you because you have similar organisms where you live. But to us, it's like we have black bears and grizzly bears. And yeah. I guess speaking from Calgary, but you know, we have all the, the more mam- mammalian fauna, mm-hmm. whereas we just don't have that kind of invertebrate amphibian and reptile diversity that the tropics has. So. Yeah. As far as, uh, in Calgary or in Alberta, do you, ha- do you ever go herping or anything? Did you ever, you guys have some rattlesnakes there? We do. Um, the rattlesnakes are a little bit more South than where I was. I mean, we also have Western hog noses. Right. Yeah. I personally never went herping once in Calgary or, or in the, like Alberta in general. Um, just not something that I knew anybody that really wanted to go or knew where to go, let yeah. alone wanted to go. So, yeah, never did. I Really, the only place I've, I go herping is Arizona with a bunch of my buddies down there. So Yeah, I've actually never gone herping here either. And we have West, we have Western Hognose as well, and, of course, the garter snakes. But and the, we have a few other things too. But yeah. I don't know why. I'm, I should go. Like, it's mm. something that should be on my bucket list. But as far as Arizona goes, do you have a connection there? Because your old name on YouTube was Phoenix. or Graphic Phoenix. Yeah, Graphic yeah. Phoenix. That was your YouTube name, right? It was, yep. And so do you have an association with Phoenix? Um, Actually, my parents own a house there. Oh, okay. So we'd go there a couple days, or a couple days, a couple times a year. Um, And especially in June, July, August, that kind of deal. I have a bunch of reptile buddies that I made down there. That Oh, cool. They actually own reptile shops, pretty much all of them now. But... Um, they'd always just, you know, it's 8 PM. Let's get on the whip and go to the mountains and find some cool stuff. So yeah, it was, that's, it's a lot of fun herping down there. Yeah. Apparently that's one of the best places in the world to go herping. Yeah. It's beautiful. And so what kind of things would you find there? Um, we found, I mean, there's a lot of scorpions, Mm. um, black widows. Uh, there's the Sonoran toad, which is really cool. Um, there's, I believe there's 13 species of crotalus, um, the, the rattlesnakes, yeah, yeah. um, that are 11. I can't remember the exact number, but there's the most diversity of rattlesnakes in the world live in Arizona. And we've seen Western diamondbacks are pretty common. Um, Mojave's, I've yet to see a sidewinder. Oh, Every so uh, like cool. It's always the day after I leave, they go out and they <laughs> find one. It's like, man... Uh, we have seen Gila monsters, which are really cool. Oh, that's amazing. Um, shoot, what else? Coach whips, uh, gopher snakes. Um, trying to think what else we've seen. Uh, there's some like shovel nose snakes and things that we've seen as well. Just yeah. some kind of, you wouldn't really know what they are unless you're with somebody that's, that like, knows what they are Exactly. Yeah. and you don't see them. They're not common in the pet hobby or anything like that. So that's kind of where the the show stops i suppose yeah yeah well that's still pretty cool it it would be cool to live in a place like that so as far as the whole youtube because we were kind of talking about this earlier youtube is great and it has you know obviously it's a great place for you to you make videos and you have a lot of success there but yeah. there's i guess there's a few issues with youtube and, and we for were talking sure. earlier is the you know the tendency for people to just any person put out advice that yep. is a lot of times really bad. Like I always say this, there, there's no correlation between how big your channel is and how the quality of your advice or of your, of your advice. Yeah. And knowledge in general. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause you could get big on YouTube for all sorts of reasons that has for nothing sure. to do with your ability to care for animals. Absolutely. <laughs> so like, what do you think about that? Like, is there a way to fix that? I think your channel does a really good job. You have a, you. a lot of subscribers while maintaining good quality care, mm-hmm. which is something that's more rare on YouTube. I, I mean, I, I like to, preach or, or I guess practice what I preach really I, I do enjoy the live bioactive setups and stuff <laughs> like that um, I tend to think that I foster a, a pretty healthy community of like-minded individuals I mean I would rather maintain a smaller channel that has more people like me that are really trying to push the the boundaries of you know improving reptile care and I know John's favorite saying is the this the thrive, not survive, yes, right? Yeah. And that's something that I'd love to push. Um, in terms of, there's exactly what you said. There's a lot of people, like, it doesn't cost anything. Everybody has a phone now. You can make yeah. content if you really wanted to. And it doesn't mean that you know what you're talking about. And th- don't get me wrong. I, I 
come from a humble place in saying that, that I don't know everything. I don't claim to know everything, but there are certain things that I consider myself more educated on than a significant portion of the, the pet tube community. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, are you comfortable with the term pet tube? Like, do you refer to yourself as pet tube or is it kind of a cringe <laughs> term for you? I, I know like my girlfriend and all that will, will say I am part of that community. Personally, I don't think I am. Mm. I don't really interact with a lot of them. Um, but I think it comes with kind of a negative stigma, especially in just the reptile keeping hobby. Obviously, yes. if you're part of the pet tube community on YouTube, there's a lot of people that love you just for the simple fact that you have pets. Yeah. Um, but when it comes down to the more serious kind of hobbyists and breeders and things like that, they see, oh, Frilly Lily is promoting this. Like they've owned this snake for a year and a half. Yeah. Like, and they're sitting there preaching that they know what they're talking about. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It is. That is kind of an interesting thing with, with the pet tube side and the sort of the negative side is I see there's just so much personification with, sure. with, with those, with their animals and yeah. everything's kind of like almost goofy in a way, yeah. which is what sort of sells. And so I kind of wonder what their analytics analytics would show in terms of the demographics watching those videos. Like it's mostly young kids, I assume. It, it is. And like my main demographic is 18 to 24 yeah. and I'm perfectly okay with that because yes. then the next highest is the 25 to 34 or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm cool there. It might not be where the broad audience is or the like serial clickers. Well, they'll just click and rewatch the video and rewatch the video. Yeah. Yeah. But that's typically where the the more like-minded folks are. Um, I don't know for sure, like from the friends that I do have, it is a lot of kids. Um, and I mean, there's pros and cons, like you mentioned to that, but yeah. it's one of those scenarios where you got to be careful because I, I know it's happened to me personally that y you don't necessarily get attacked, but you say something, you speak out and I'm, I'm, typically a pretty blunt individual that, you know, I'll speak my mind and maybe you don't like it, but it's more or less true. And that's when I speak my mind is when I know what I'm talking about. So yeah, yeah. I try not to hold back too much and you get ridiculed for it. You get kind of put in your box over there that it's like, well, you know, we don't like that guy. So well, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I tried. <laughs> what can has, I do? Has your channel, was there anything that caused it to spike in growth or has no. it just been a, just a, like a linear it's just been a, a constant grind through, yeah, through yeah. the whole thing. There's one video that did really well last Christmas um, was like the feeding all my pets video. Yeah. And that just exploded but for my channel. I mean, I think it has 350,000 views somewhere around there. So in a grand scheme of YouTube, it's kind of a drop in the ocean, but yeah, yeah. for my channel, it's, it's pretty awesome good. to see. Yeah. And um, that definitely caused a spike, but not really noticeable because I mean, I've, I, I mean, I spent three months in Ontario this summer to where it's, I can't really post any content. I think I posted two or three videos that entire three months. And yeah. the, the YouTube algorithm is definitely like, feed me, feed me. Yeah, yeah. The more you post, the especially the more consistent you post, the more you get pushed, right? Yeah. So you kind of see the, the ups and then it goes down and then it goes up again, and then it goes down. And See, that's the issue with the algorithm is it that like the fact that it wants us to continue posting uh, quantity over quality yeah. because it doesn't analyze quality. No. There's no way for the al algorithm no. to analyze quality. So you can get as long as someone's pumping out videos, it doesn't matter what it is, it's going to start pu pushing that up. Absolutely, and it, and it really does also favor watch time. So there's a lot of people that don't necessarily have great content or know a lot about animals, but they're doing crazy things. They're adding these animals to my farm and stuff yeah. like that, and. I mean, <laughs> yeah. You, you is do that you. Paul Cafiro? <laughs> yeah, <Yep. laughs> that's exactly what I was uh, talking about. Got another goat from my backyard. Yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, dude. Like, why don't you pull your axolotl out of the twenty gallon, please? <laughs> yes. But so, but and that that is a huge. Like when I first started making YouTube videos, I realized that very soon was like an easy way to have content continuing to flow is getting another animal, mm -hmm, and absolutely. that's a very dangerous game to play. Oh, for sure. And yeah. Is there a way to like because and then that's what happens, right? You yep. they realize you get a new animal, and then so there's this ho almost like hoarding. Yeah, is, is there a way to like w anything to, that you do to stop yourself from getting more animals than you can have? Um, or have you ever been to a point where you're like, I have way more than I should have? I don't think I've ever hit that point. Um, I I mean maybe some 
haters of the channel or whatever will, will argue <laughs> those that. Those people but that give you thumbs down. Exactly. <laughs> those, those negative nallies. But uh, they, in general, I don't, I don't think there really is a way. I think it's promoting yourself, you know, you're, you're, or you really got to put yourself first and, and know what you can handle and know when, you know, maybe you shouldn't have certain animals in much too small cages and, and yeah. things like that. Like I see it all the time with numerous pet tubers that, that are doing that. And I know recently there has been people that have kind of taken a break off, off YouTube and, and have deleted a lot of their old videos and kudos to them. Like yeah. that's something that if they really are going to come back and improve their care, because I know there's like not speaking about anybody in specific, but there's a lot of people that will simply just be, Oh, I'm going to improve my care. And they stop for a while or a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, whatever, however long it is. And they come back and it's the exact same as it was before. And yeah. it's like, well, okay. <laughs> yeah. You, <laughs> thanks for trying. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for saying it and then not doing yeah. it. But I, I've done that before too, where I have a video, like I did, I had a care guide at one point for a day gecko. And then, you know, a year and a half, two years later, I'm like, you know what? I didn't, that wasn't great. Like it, there's things I know now that yeah. I should have said in it. So just take it off. Yeah. And I, I suppose I am being a little bit hypocritical now that I'm thinking about it. Like I do have some handling your chameleon videos. That's mm. like one of the most popular videos on my channel or like raising your baby veiled chameleons. And granted that is an like eight year old video. So it's yeah. kind of like, well, I hope you're looking for a little bit newer information yeah. than yeah. an eight year old YouTube video. But with that said, like I haven't deleted them yet. Mm, yeah. um, I'm in talks with Bill Strand to get some footage from him and and kind of chat with him about what his thoughts and and what his experience with some like forty years of chameleon experience is with handling and mm. things like that. So what, what what's the? Because I'm not super familiar with chameleons. Is it handling just something that's just like off limits in general? It's, or it's a, I think a lot of pet stores will kind of preach them as a much more hands-off animal. Mm -hmm. However, there is a lot of people that want to break that. They they want to buy the chameleon that's their best friend and they love and it loves to come out and hang out with me. And <laughs> yeah. you see that a lot on YouTube where yes, yeah. like even P Veil Chameleon or Panther Chameleon care videos and they're holding the chameleon as jet black and it's oh, it's so <laughs> cute. It's like, yeah, it's hissing and its neck is yeah. blowing out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like, okay, well, if you knew anything about animal behavior, you'd know that you're stressing the crap out of your chameleon. Exactly, yeah. And even with my old old animals they typically like to come out i i also had a mother that was guilty of the, the personification and the very much like oh i want to hold them and stuff like yeah. that and it's it's really hard to explain to a mother when <laughs> also shout out to your mom by the way for the amount of because because i was watching one of your videos and you're just like you know you were gone for two months or whatever yeah. and she cared for all your she did and and she did an amazing job there was uh, there was an isopod massacre. There was some <laughs> plants that uh, didn't survive, but overall, I mean, everything was in great health. And and yeah, and I mean, I know she won't listen to this, but but thank you, mom. I really appreciate it. That's, so so that's a big job. Like oh, for is sure. Is she an animal lover to begin with? Um, or did you have to kind of like walk her through that? And she she does love animals. Like we've always had cats. She always had dogs growing up. But the the reptiles was definitely under my influence. Yeah. Um, she definitely took more interest in them than my dad did. Like my dad loves my tortoise and love my old chameleons and things like that. But in general, he's just kind of like, yep, they're in the basement, whatever. Yeah. And my mom is much more comes from home from work and and she works a full time job. Like she works a lot, so I knew it was a lot to ask. Well, actually, she offered. She said, you know what? Due to COVID, I'm home. I'm not you know, doing my 35, 40 minute drive to work right. every day. This is your opportunity. Go out there, do what you need to do and, and come back and I'll do this for you. So, yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Oh, it was for sure. Yeah. I, I've definitely had my mom come by like when, when I'm away and get her to come check on the animals, but, yeah. but for a month or two months, that's a long, cause it's not just oh, like sure. change waters, it's feed and yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Fill up the Miss King, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> missed everybody and yeah. Yeah. Moms are great for that. I I have this, uh, uh, several years ago, I had a giant fish tank that cr I used to be a competitive swimmer, so I'd be gone all the oh, time. Wow. And uh, so one year I was training in Vegas and my 75 gallon fish tank oh. cracked or it didn't crack, but there was a, it eventually did crack, but a, a filter, a fish must've hit it. And it was like, mm. you know, spraying water out yeah. onto the floor. And of course it, my mom's the only one there. <laughs> so, Calls you freaking out. Yeah, like, yeah I wake up, on? the time changes all different. So I look at my phone, I got like messages all galore, yeah. like, but 
I guess moms are just good at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love fish tanks, but when, when they go wrong, they go wrong. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. I had a, I had a buddy that had a 210 crack, like the <sighs> bottom bursted out on him. So oh, I had 210 burst? gallons of water all over his oh. floor. And it's like, Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. Mine did eventually crack, but it was just like a hairline across the bottom. Mm. So it was just like slowly, you know, like over an like hour drop. Drip. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, this is bad, but it didn't shatter. But it made nice. me realize like, I can never have an fish. Like I lived in an apartment at the time, so I'm mm-hmm. like I have to wait until I'm in a house to yeah. get fish. But fish are almost more work than reptiles. It's, I'm like hesitant to go back to fish. They certainly can be, and and a lot of people don't know because I didn't actually make much content about it. But I've I mean I've worked in pet stores for pretty much my whole life. Yeah, and I worked at Pisces Pet Emporium. It's the largest pet store, second largest in the world. Really? Wait, I, that's in Calgary? Yeah. Oh wow, yeah. I didn't even know that was there. Yeah, I have I have a video on it on the channel, but it's uh. It's a huge 3,500 square foot or 35,000 square foot um, giant, basically, warehouse, essentially. Wow. There's something along the lines of 750 fish tanks. Holy. And uh, a ton of staff to look after it all, obviously. But uh, yeah, it's fish were almost more like a, a more significant portion of my day and my care knowledge i suppose than reptiles were just due to the fact that i had to learn how to care for them all and and know how to sell them to customers and stuff like that yeah know what species go together and which ones don't i actually do really like fish i I would love to get back into them but yeah but i want to wait for and to have more space i'm like for sure real estate at this point yeah (laughs) (laughs) um so one one other thing that I know you've done twice, I think, is you've gone down and helped Brian set up his zoos. Correct. Yeah. So Brian is a contentious character, um, as <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. And I've spoken to Brian a few times on the phone. Awesome. He's a nice guy. He is. He's a really nice yeah. guy. I know he gets a lot of hate, and there there is a lot of things that well, I think now, like I've always said, he he is shifting in a way that I think is good for the hobby. Agreed. As, and it yeah. seems like he actually wants to get rid of his breeding operation, even though he won't really admit it. But, I, yeah. I've had personal <laughs> conversations with him that. Uh, Allude to that. It, correct, yeah. Yeah, and even now he's talking about it on his channel. Yeah, I, I've seen nice. a few. He's kind of saying, yeah. like, we want to downsize this, which I think is yeah. great, and I think that makes sense. Um, but anyway, so the, the only point is that it's like, I'm not a hater of him. I understand where he's coming from, but okay. I also... I, I <laughs> Good, I was like, okay, what what way are you coming at yeah, this from? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, he, he is... I, 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 he's a, he's nice. Like, when I've yes. talked to him, he's always been really nice to me, and, uh, and I think now he's kind of opening up to the fact that these animals are maybe a little bit more sophisticated than he thought mm-hmm. and, you know, providing bigger spaces for them. And the zoo is obviously doing that for him. Yeah. Um, so tell me about those experiences going down. And I think you helped with the opening both. of both. Yeah. 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 Um, it was, it was crazy. Um, I, I will say there was a few like me and the few buddies that I went with the first time. Um, Stuart, Brian, uh, Stuart's the owner of universal rock. Yeah. Um, there's a, uh, probably 10 or 15 guys there, guys and girls, I guess, that, that were very helpful. But there was another 15 to 30 people just kind of sitting there standing, waiting to meet Brian. Oh, Which, yes. I mean, from his perspective, you can't say anything to them. Like, it's not like, hey, you know, we're kind of a job to do here. I mean, they're just yeah, excited he, that they're there and they get to meet Brian and, and all that. And he kind of just opened and, it up. He said, if you want to come down, exactly. come down. So he yeah. kind of almost asked for that in uh, a way. Yeah. When he said that, I was like, oh, boy. Okay. Well, <laughs> here we go. We'll see what yeah. happens. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very much a character that if I'm there to work, Gonna I'm work. there to work. Yeah. And it was five or six 12, 13, 14 hour days of just getting disgusting and universal rock and hacking stuff and cutting things apart and setting up enclosures and attaching heat mats to the bottom and throwing on thermostats and all that. Like it was, it was a ton of work, but it was rewarding in the sense that we started with an empty building and yeah. we ended with a zoo in like a week. Yeah. Cause I guess that first time it was literally empty. Like yeah. you guys were bringing in the enclosures. Yeah. yeah. It was completely empty. The, the first one, like I have pictures on my phone of like an empty building and then three days later it's packed. Yeah. So that's, it that's was, super cool. It was cool seeing the community come together like that. And, and like you said, Brian is a very contentious character. I will, I will always vouch for him. Like I have videos on my channel kind of preaching his name and stuff like that because in my opinion there's a lot of videos out there that yeah they they definitely paint him in a negative light and and a lot of it is also uh, kind of hand-picked I guess context where 
I know some things with like the the monitor in the tub and and you know always looking to get bit or Lori saying that he killed like thirty leopard geckos or something like that. Yeah, and those are all little snippets of context that nobody will actually acknowledge the full video of that up to that point saying oh yeah it was all an entire joke like none of that actually happened and to be quite frank when he opened up like i got there a few days before the actual like be or the reptarium i guess opened or we started construction on it and he said to me and my buddies who are all relatively well versed in the reptile community and and we said go look for a mite go look for an unhealthy animal yeah. And he just opened up. Like we had free reign to go through any bin we wanted, open up and we we checked for mice. We checked for unhealthy animals and any collection of that size has a snake a snake with a RI or a you know, a sick snake, but they were yeah. all being treated, they were all recognized, they were all being dealt with. Yeah. So, and no no snake mites. Like yeah, it was, that's it was amazing, crazy. Yeah. yeah, like in a collection of that size is astonishing and granted we didn't check every single animal so we can't say but you know if one snake has it in in a collection of that size it's gonna be over all over the place yeah yeah no i think people on the internet are weird like i get that i I get the whole you know they 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 see the industrialized style care Mm -hmm. and they don't like that although what they don't maybe realize is that is how captive breeding happens a lot of times in other places that don't open their doors and brian does he Mm -hmm. you know he puts a camera in there that's and and as i've said earlier on like industrialized breeding does have a spot in the hobby that's where we're buying our animals from for the most part i mean why do you think petco and all those places have snakes for 25 (laughs) dollars yeah the reality of it right it has yeah exactly they get produced and and uh and then, but yeah, people on the internet just attack him, his character, you yeah. know, and it's just like, yeah, of course people make mistakes. And if you're making videos on YouTube for 15 years, you're going to have stuff on there that you're not proud of, <laughs> Yeah, but it, uh, they attack him as a person, which mm-hmm. is the wrong thing to do. Agreed. And I think it's totally unmerited. Like, I mean, like I said, there was 30 people there that were doing nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and even I'm sitting there like, come on guys, like you're here, just pick up a board and move it or yeah, at least sweep act the like floor. You're or, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like pretend that you're doing something. And and he didn't say a word. He was happy and jolly the whole time. He was obviously stressed to no end because of what was happening. But yeah, yeah. Um, just in general, he's one of the nicest people in the hobby that I've met. He's always open to talk. He's, uh, I mean, if you know him, he's open to talk numbers and, and discuss plans and things like that. And yeah. it's just something that is it's refreshing to me at least. Yeah. Yeah, he is an interesting guy and he definitely gets painted in probably the wrong light and mm-hmm. and uh which is it, I guess is the what's going to happen if you're on the internet. Yeah. That's just kind yeah. of the, the the name of the game. Was the working on the second one more fun or more difficult or was there a difference? Uh, it, there was actually a huge difference. Um it was way more planned out and mm-hmm. more structured. It was more we're doing A to B. I need these people to do this. I need mm. these people to do this. I need these people to do this. Like Lori definitely had her grips on the, <laughs> on the operation a little yeah. bit more, um, which is good. Like it, it went very smooth. So I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but no, she's more structured for sure. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, she's definitely the boss. Like yeah. even all the staff there, you walk by and it's like, well, ask the boss. I'm like, Brian, you know, Hey, like, other boss. I'm like, Oh, <laughs> Lori. Yeah. So, um, yeah it was it was a lot more structured it it took place a lot faster and it was also in the winter so right, it was yeah. snowing and sleeting and all this stuff when we were down there trying to move all these tanks inside and and uh it, it was a lot of fun but it, it definitely was different it was more kind of a structure like maybe six hours eight hours kind of deal and we're way ahead of the schedule, so. Yeah, interesting. Well, yeah. I, I love the way that the zoo's in, in, evolving and that it's become, <laughs> that his channel is more focused on the zoo and less focused on breeding in racks, and yeah. you know, it's going to encourage people to want to keep their ball python in a you know a nice enclosure where you can see it For sure. rather than in a tub. And I do hope that he does more like planted tanks and whatnot because right now there's no plants. It's just kind of plastics and um, stuff. Or does the he have the some? dart frog tanks are oh yeah yeah are, are live planted. Yeah. Um, he, he was talking with me originally and, and a couple of my buddies to set up a, a live tank for him, but uh, it just like it's so crazy in those few days, and we're never down there for more than five, six, seven days, and right. it's all just all right. Well, now it's time for detail work, and now it's time for this, and now it's time for that. You know, it's never like all right, let's sit down and we're gonna film you guys making it and stuff like that. Like it's just a, a go go just go, go yeah yeah. yeah. 
yeah, no, so yeah, it, it's cool. It's great to see a channel like that moving towards bigger and enrichment and, and whatnot. So, Agreed. so that's awesome. Just want to see if I have, I think I've almost covered everything that uh, I had on my special list here. Awesome. Um, as far as future plans, do you have future plans and goals with reptiles and YouTube channel right now, or are you just kind of trying to reset? Right. Yeah. Essentially, it's a, I guess, a reset. Not necessarily on the channel, but on on the keeping and things. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. I mean, it broke down every cage, so it's a, a full reset in that sense. Like um, you, you, you're still going to bring the same cages. They just you've just correct. torn them down and flat pack them, and no, they're all fully built like they're all oh, they're I all see. just wrapped in in like furniture pads and stuff like gotcha. that so you just so got to reset hoping them up. they're you know come in one piece but, yeah yeah um in general i i see myself setting up more kind of like troy's room where it's a more display oriented yeah um, his he has the best room out there a hundred percent like I, I i've been there and i've seen it in person oh, you've and been there it, yeah and it is something to marvel at like and, and it wasn't even done when i was there like he oh. was he still had the few of those really big tanks that he built and stuff like that left and it was incredible just to see his eye for detail and just the simplicity but the complexity of each tank where it's yeah. kind of a few pieces of wood but like 30 different species of plants in one tank and the frogs just thriving and doing so well and all the rare frogs that he has as well is is really cool to see in person. Well, that's what I was saying to him. Like you, the fact that you're an artist must play a role in this. And he's like, I don't know if it does. I think I'm just, but I think it does. Cause it he, does. he is 100%. amazing at it. Yeah. Yeah. It does hundred percent. He's, and, he's an amazing artist. I know him and I kind of went at it about his uh, sculpting ability, but it was more me just kind of poking fun at him. <laughs> he's, he is an artist by like schooling. Yeah. Yeah. And he is very humble about it where he's like, oh you know it doesn't really affect it but it for sure does yeah. because there's and i guess there's a place for the whole experience part of it and just making 24 tanks in total like you can definitely see an evolution from his first tank that he built to the most recent tank right. that he built but that's expected and and i think it's just a play between the the experience and the artistic eye and just you know, the rule of thirds and exactly. that kind of stuff. Yeah. And the, I mean, the way the room is set up is it's a thumbnail. It's a click magnet. Like oh, people yeah. just, and, and yeah. it's not, a, it's not clickbait at all. It's no. like exactly what you see is what you get. Yeah. And you see that and just like, you have to click like, on it to whoa. see what is that. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's really amazing. Absolutely. So you want to set something up similar to that. Similar to that. I'm not, I, I know he's probably going to listen to this and get at me for it, but he's uh <laughs> very much it won't be the same kind of you know uniform tank styles and everything like that just because i have more variation in animals different animals yeah so uh, it'll be a few display dart frog tanks i do plan to get my first snake so that's gonna be exciting Wait, you've never had a snake never oh my gosh never. that's a whole other episode yeah right <laughs> never had a snake and i i do have a plan for for what the first one's gonna Are be you, can you reveal it or that's still yeah secret? I, i'll reveal it here first oh and, my gosh uh, people might hate it or love it i don't know but i'm, I'm planning to get a emerald tree boa first oh my gosh yeah. how could anyone hate that yeah. oh well you know who's oh, not a beginner snake <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's if you're never bought a reptile exactly. in your life like yeah. i love green snakes <laughs> yeah yeah that's an amazing snake to get wow i'm hoping so yeah and that's not a cheap snake in canada by the no. way for not for the nope. americans like buy them for 300 bucks no. they're gonna that's gonna be like 13 or 14 or maybe more yeah yeah and i have a buddy that will hopefully produce some but yeah it's like a thousand to fifteen hundred dollar snake for yeah. sure so yeah that is cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Is, is, is he? Does he produce them in Ontario somewhere, or do you have to ship it across the country? Uh, no, he's actually in Alberta. So oh, he's in Alberta. So yeah, you gotta ship it. Ship it. Yeah. So that's not too bad. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. So when I'm when excited. is that? This calendar year or? Um, I don't know. We'll see how things go. Yeah. Um, I, I I would like to have the tank set up and everything first, obviously, and and really get my kind of just my roots into the ground there and yeah, get everything have set everything up. set up and stuff like that before I'm, you, you know, I'm going to go buy. Then it brings back the whole hoarding scenario of, <laughs> yeah. of buying new animals. Yeah, before you're done set up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't believe you've not owned a, owned a snake before. Is there a reason for that? Or it's just because... My parents. Oh, yeah. I see. It, yeah, was, okay. it was the rule of the house. It was, uh, if you're in our house, you can keep 
anything else except snakes. That's Got the, it. That was the Got hard it. rule of. Which is snakes. fair enough. They let you get a lot. So. Exactly. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so, you know what? I can't. I can't complain too much with what they've let me own. So. It is funny though, because that's a really common rule for many reptile people right yeah. first it's like don't even bring a reptile in and then yeah. you, you, you might get a gecko or something mm-hmm. but i always love and i've talked to so many people on the podcast who's like when did you get your first reptile like the week i moved out yeah. <laughs> you know that's so yeah. often people like move out and they're like now that i can get this i'm gonna go yeah, out and get finally it. it's time <laughs> yeah so that's cool and then i guess uh, we i mean people are very familiar with your animals but maybe you could just give a quick run out you don't have to run through every animal but sure. what are some of the animals that you own you actually picked up some new animals recently i think the with the iguana yes so yeah. maybe you could talk about that too yeah so I, I mean i guess the most notable um i have leopard gecko that's kind of the original one yeah i got um a pair of Euromastics, a hopeful pair of jumata spangleri or the vietnamese black-breasted mm. leaf turtles um, I have some dart frogs, uh, morning geckos, um, the pair of Bradabodian and Thunderbottes or the, I think it's the Natal dwarf chameleons. Mm. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and then my girlfriend and I bought a Fijian banded iguana, which is one of the coolest looking lizards there is. It, yeah. It's insane. It's one of the most beautiful like dream species that you can have and and thankfully in Canada there are a few producers of them and it's I a captive this, bred it from is. Canada? Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yep. That's and awesome. uh you you can't get them from or you can't own them in the states so Oh, you can't? No. The Lacey Act. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. I, I didn't realize that. Yeah. So, a lot of people are on that video that where I revealed it were like, oh, I can't wait to get one. I'm like, where do you live? They're like, oh, well, you know, Georgia. I'm like, well, nope. sorry to tell you, yeah. but <laughs> not going to happen. Hate to break your dreams. Maybe someday, but definitely not anytime soon. Was it expensive? Yes. Do you yeah. mind telling me how much? Uh, 1700 bucks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny how you know, early in your pet, in your reptile days, you could never imagine spending yeah. that much, but eventually you work your way up to justifying it. Like, yeah. Oh. Especially if you split it. <laughs> yeah. That, that was the nice part too. So yeah. 800 bucks each. You're yeah. Good to go. Yeah. It, was, it wasn't a, I mean, split, it wasn't a crazy amount. Like yeah. the, the Spangler I were as expensive. Right. Yeah. So, it, I mean, of course, yeah. When you start, it's the $40 leopard gecko or the, the $20 crested gecko or whatever. And then you slowly like, well, you I guess I could justify this. And then you slowly extend that justification yeah, yeah. of like, man, I'm going to spend a thousand dollars on <laughs> yeah. this. Oh boy. Yeah. 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 You just close your eyes and swipe the yeah. card. <laughs> just take my money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's awesome. So as far as, uh, are you vlogging this trip or recording this trip or are you just going to get there and just set yourself back up? Kind and- of. Um, I did vlog the whole process. Uh, I guess I'll, depending on when this comes out, um, people will hear it here first that, Unfortunately, I actually lost my blue tongue skink. Oh, no. Um, I don't know what happened. Mm. Everything else in the box was totally fine. Was that on, on the travel? On the, yeah, on the ship. Oh, damn. On the, so on the when, when, when the shipment got there, your girlfriend opened and, uh, and, yeah. and it was a she, right? Or was it he? It was a male. It was yeah, a male. It yeah. was a male. So, oh, that's too bad. Yeah, that it sucks. And, and you know, it's, it's a pet that I've had for seven eight years so yeah it's, it's, it was one of those animals it's like man really like and that's the thing it's the worst is the when ones. you there's just no way to know what happened exactly and like I, I told her i was like you know what keep the body we'll see if we can maybe get a post-mortem done but i honestly don't think anything's gonna show up yeah like, yeah it was probably some complication with altitude or or something because the rest of the animals were fine yeah yeah and they're all in one box so it wasn't that you know the top corner of the box was bone chilling cold and the rest was normal. You yeah, know, yeah. Does, that wouldn't make sense. So, um, I, I guess going back to the question, yeah, I am making a video of kind of the process. Um, unfortunately the movers moved everything so fast and I just didn't want to get in their way. Cause my room is <laughs> smaller than the room we're sitting in now. So like, yeah, quite so- a bit smaller. So it was, uh, one of those scenarios where, two guys were there just ripping through all the stuff, getting it all together and out the door. And I'm like, you know what? Just do your thing. Yeah, just, yeah. You know, and then they came and moved stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that time lapse would have been cool, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. And throw it up in the corner, but I packed all my tripods and stuff. So yeah. <laughs> I yeah. would have, but yeah. there's no real means to set it up. So, so there will be some documentation of it on your channel at yeah. some point. So I yeah. imagine it'll take you uh, a couple of weeks to get set up. Correct. And those out. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, is there anything else you wanted to add before we wrap up? Um, 
thanks for reaching out. I've, I've always wanted to do a podcast. Um, I'm, I'm actually hoping of starting up my own. Do with, it. With potentially Troy and a couple other buddies. Oh, so yeah. Awesome. Could be an interesting podcast. That's I guess it's out there now. So <laughs> got to make it <laughs> now happen. you got to do it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there's other than that, I mean, just strive to do better. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's harsh, but it's true. Like yeah. Just try and improve something every day um, or, or you know, every new animal you get, find some way to improve its care. Or, you know, when you clean the cage, make something cooler, put a live plant in there, add UVB to your leopard gecko, do something, you yeah. know? Um, and, uh, I want to thank you for, for having me on and driving out here and no, <laughs> kind of last minute just going, Hey, you know what? You want to do this? Yeah. Let's literally go. this was planned today. It was not on the schedule. So I appreciate you agreeing to do this as well. And yeah. I think finishing off with that, that note of improvement is great. Can you let everybody know where they can find you online? I'm sure most people know, but just in case they don't. For sure. Uh, you can find me at Mike Titula on YouTube. Uh, or Alpha Reptile as well, as well and on Instagram. I do have Twitter. I don't use it a ton. Mm. Uh, you got to get to see more of the, the, the memes and stuff that I enjoy and, and <laughs> the things that kind of make me chuckle over there. But uh, beyond that, yeah, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, that kind of deal. Um, I do have merch if people are interested. I got to plug that as well. I got yeah. the, the Brad Pody and Themnabates and the... Uh, the the turtles as well so your shirt looks awesome or sweater i suppose oh, thank you thank you gonna have to pick myself up some of those yeah yeah we should trade <laughs> awesome. merch. yeah let's do it awesome well mike this is a pleasure thank you so much thank you for having me appreciate it all right that brings us to the end of that episode of the podcast mike thank you so much for agreeing to do that that is the best impromptu episode of the podcast i have ever recorded i know you must have been incredibly exhausted by the time we hit the record button so super grateful that you did that and we'll definitely record one in the future once you set up at your new place and to the listeners thank you so much for listening to this episode of the podcast what do you think do you have any other plants that mike didn't mention that you think are very successful in a vervarium do you think mike and troy goldberg should start that podcast i am very much in favor of that so if you agree with me make sure you let them know in the comments so we can force them to do that and what are your thoughts on brian barczak i know we've talked about it lots of times on the podcast before do you agree with me that his new direction with the zoo is something that's beneficial for the hobby or do you think the you know sort of transgressions of the past don't outweigh the fact that he's now promoting reptiles in a more positive way i'm always curious to see what you guys think i know that again that's a very contentious subject and i will finish off by saying mike did not start his snake keeping career with an emerald tree boa like he said in the podcast if you go to his instagram you'll see one of his latest pictures he shows the snake that he bought and i'm so jealous of it it's a beautiful snake so go take a look at that i'm sure eventually he will get an emerald tree boa as well if you did enjoy this episode of the podcast make sure you subscribe to itunes as well as youtube share the content on Instagram and Facebook and make sure you give the podcast a five-star rating on the Apple podcasting app. Thank you very much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you are looking for anything reptile related, head to the show notes or the link in the show notes as well as the link in the YouTube description box and it will take you right there. And of course that is an affiliate link. So if you do pick up something, it will support the show. I will catch you guys in the next episode.